one 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 all right all right so it's time let's start all right so my name is Alex and uh, I will be talking today about penetration testing of open source databases MySQL and PostgreSQL and uh, let me introduce myself real quick so I have my background is MySQL database open source databases I have been doing consulting for a long time I uh, started the MySQL AB a company behind MySQL uh, in 2006 and I started as MySQL consultant uh, MySQL architect and uh, have survived through two acquisitions, Sun Microsystems, Oracle. I work for Percona, uh, doing the same job, pretty much, helping customers to um, do best with uh, MySQL. And then about two years ago, I uh, joined Amazon Web Services as a database engineer working on RD, uh, RDS. And people were asking, what RDS is, and I think I need to explain what RDS is. RDS is uh, Relational Database as a Service, and RDS allows customers to start open source database. In this talk, I will not be talking about RDS. I will be talking about open source databases, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and uh, when I, uh, for the purposes of this talk, when I say MySQL, I really mean uh, MySQL or any forks of MySQL like Percona server or the same thing applies to MariaDB. So I have acquired interest in security. Security, IT security uh, was sort of my hobby. I started playing capture the flag games, CTF games and it was amazing experience i started learning about that and at aws i switched to security related job i'm currently leading what we called rds red team rds red team is doing penetration testing we're pretty much pretending to be bad actors and trying to attack our own services to find all security issues before bad guys will find so let me start with a common database pen test. So what is pen test? What is penetration test? Basically, if you want to find, if you want to catch an attacker, you need to think like attacker. So you need to be and become an attacker and penetration tester. The typical scenario, though, where we think about database security is this one. We have our application server. We have our database. And our database is sort of protected from the outside. And it's protected by firewall. It can be protected on a networking level, anything like this. However, there is one very simple and very well-known scenario where the database can be exposed by the attacker through the application. Anyone knows what kind of scenario that can be? Yes. Exactly. SQL injection. So this is our level one. And scenario level one where we pretend to be an attacker here and try to do SQL injection, and what happens after an attacker gets an SQL injection? It gets into the database. I will be talking about relational databases, uh, open source relational databases, MySQL and PostgreSQL. The majority of my talk will cover MySQL-based uh, systems, like MySQL itself, MySQL Community Edition, uh, uh, Percona server, MariaDB, whatever. I will be talking a little bit about PostgreSQL in one particular scenario. So let's uh, see what SQL injection. 
SQL injection actually became famous after this XKCD comic, where Bobby was able to use SQL injection to drop table students. This is very well known, and uh, any slides on SQL injection, of course, should include this comic. So I was unable to not do that. So this is, this is the comic here. But how do we see this? What's the reality of SQL injection? So this is the example that I came from, uh, came, uh, came with. So that's actually me. That's me looking like this. And this guy is actually surprised seeing this. I'm not surprised. I saw worse. But what is wrong here? This published thing. This data is coming directly from the customer. Unsanitized. Passing directly into the database. In this case, MySQL database or whatever, MariaDB database. And this is really, really bad. This is not the real code. I adapted this code to make it bad, but a similar code exists over the internet. If you Google something, you may find very bad examples. So I would say don't try this at home. It's not a real example, uh, but you may find those things over the internet. So don't copy paste. So what can happen? Well, there are particular cases that can happen, and our Bobby could have just simply dropped table students. But the really bad guy is after something else, right? A really bad guy is after some information in that lives inside this database. But one particular thing that an attacker can do on top of MySQL is to get the MySQL users back and gets the passwords back. And this is called privilege escalation inside the database. For this particular case, I'm using this example where I inject a part of the query with a union, which will pretty much ignore what the logic was before and turn it into selecting a username and password from the MySQL system database. The question is, for this particular scenario, I'm not talking about other things. At this point, I'm not even talking about why it's bad and how we can fix it. I'm talking about, I'm asking just one question. Why does this application user have an ability to select from the MySQL system database? And to answer that question, I will go through a couple of scenarios with you. But before we'll go through, I want to say that in this particular case, uh, going back to the code, we know the code, right? But in reality, we may not know, we, we may not have an access to the source code. And we somehow need to detect this as an attacker, as a pen tester. We need to detec detect that SQL injection and exploit it. There is a tool called SQL Map. And this tool will do a giant brute force, trying all different combinations of closing the SQL statement and injection in injecting different stuff. Yet, in the end, if you try the SQL map on that particular example where we have an access to the uh, passwords, it can even decrypt the passwords. It, it will do the brute force attack on the passwords. And in this case, the another problem with this particular database is that uh, the password for the root user or whatever the user it is um, is MySQL, which is cracked in milliseconds. So let's go back to MySQL privilege model. Historically, a typical MySQL application 
web application will consist of one to several databases. And uh, it was easy to separate those databases. Let's say typical application have a web application database, a backend database, and we also have all the MySQL installations or MariaDB, whatever, installations has this MySQL system database. MySQL system database is where MySQL stores usernames and passwords. So if we create uh, usernames for the typical web application, we usually have, already have a super user, root user, which have an access to all the databases. Then we create a database web application and then we create a user which have all access to that particular web application. And this is how there is a separation between the web application user and uh, MySQL system database, for example. Now we configure our application to use this uh, web app user. And everything is good. So MySQL DB here is isolated. Nowadays, with uh, a rise, with the rose of software as a service, there is a tendency to have a database with a customer isolation. Imagine that you're designing a software as a service and you have multi -tenant, multiple tenant there. Then what you do is to isolate those customers, you create a whole database for that particular customer and you assign um, basically your application works with that database and you assign the username associated with this database. In MySQL database is sort of different from other relational databases like Postgres. In MySQL database is pretty much a schema or a directory on disk. When you create a, um, a database, MySQL behind the scenes we cr will, create a data will create a directory on disk. And then all tables will be located inside that directory. So in theory, that's very good. But in reality, here's what happens. It's very hard to manage users in this model. And the majority of the application developers and designers will choose to create a single application user which have an all access to all the databases. And that all databases include MySQL system database. So basically you're creating a user that have everything. Okay, this is wrong, but we only have select, insert, update, and delete. So, what happens here is that we can select other users. And remember, the majority of the MySQL installations has a super user, a root user, which have everything. So basically, we can select the password for the admin user or root user. But even worse, because we have insert, update, and delete, we can manually change the password for our admin user and reconnect. It's like changing ETC password file or ETC shadow file. If you have a file system access, you can do anything. That's a very similar situation in MySQL where you have an access to, uh, basically we created a user with have an access to everything. So you have keys to the kingdom here. And this is pretty bad, that's, that's the risk. So we change the admin path, we now can do anything. That's privilege escalation right away. But also we, can, we don't even need to do that, we can grant all and every privilege to ourselves in this particular scenario. We can simply update mysql.user, set this super privilege to, to yes, and then this user will, be, will become a super privilege. So we came from this, insert, update, delete, 
to the super privilege on the target. So the bottom line here, controlling the minus kill user table means that you can get any additional privilege. That's really bad. What's the right way of doing this? Well, the right way of doing it, if you if you want to, if you want to fix the privilege escalation for that particular user, you can be more selective. And let's imagine that we start our database with a sequila. And Sakili is the name for dolphin. Uh, and if we start our database with Sakila always, we can say Sakila underscore percent. And that will disallow an access to the MySQL system database. But it, it will also disallow to create the database with, um, mm, with not following this uh, pattern, right? So, what's the risk? Uh, what's the risk again? What if we are not uh, following the pattern? What if we create a database and we have chosen this, uh, I would say it's a horrible idea. Uh, but uh, let's say imagine that we have decided to do a hash of the customer name or something similar to that. There's no pattern here. And with no pattern, it's very easy to make this security mistake and create a user which will have an access to all and every databases. So this is our privilege escalation. And our path goes from through the SQL injection to the database to the privilege escalation inside the database. So next I will talk about what is new in MySQL 8, which will allow to fix that situation? And then I will, after that, I will follow this attacker path, how an attacker can progress through the uh, accessing the database and further on. So MySQL 8.0 changed the privilege model. And what is new in MySQL 8 is an introduction to uh, an introduction of uh, so-called uh, global revokes or partial revokes. Before MySQL uh, 8.0, we will not be able to grant everything except. And partial revokes is exactly what we need. What we're looking for, we want to grant access to all the database except for MySQL system database because this is exactly what we want to protect. So if before MySQL 8, if we want to revoke something that we haven't specifically, explicitly granted, we will receive an error. Here in this example, I'm trying to revoke all privileges on MySQL.star and it says there is no such grant. So I am una unable to grant all except. But in MySQL 8, I can enable this new feature called partial revokes, uh, and then I can grant all on the application, and then I can revoke all from MySQL system database. So now my MySQL database is protected. With this protection, it actually works ev um, for everything else. I can create a database with a random name. It still works. The only thing that I will not be able to do is to update the MySQL.users or whatever tables inside of the MySQL system database. I will not be able to select from those and stuff like that. So my database is protected here. Another thing that is related to uh, partial revokes is uh, the roles. Roles is a collection of privileges and it is much easier now in MySQL 8 to organize our privilege for that specific user and uh, create a role, assign the role. Role has been uh, in other databases in PostgreSQL for example for a long time. Mm, MySQL was lacking ro roles before 
MySQL 8. So with roles, it is very easy to create a specific role for the application, which will also include the revoke. So I'm creating an application role. I am specifically revoking all the privileges from the MySQL system database, and I'm applying this role to my application user. And that will give me the protection I want. All right, so this is the example where I do uh, clean up all privileges. I grant app role to my app, and app is the user that I configure my application with to connect to MySQL. Then I set it to default. It's very important to set it to default. And then uh, I can see that this role is granted to my app user. And if I try to update command, from that user, then I'm unable to do that because the role contains the revoke. All right, that's, that's all good. So let's see what our bad actor and attacker can do further. And I want to caution you because I will show you really bad things. <laughs> let's see. So our database pen test, or an attack, a simulated attack, progresses. And it progresses to what I call level 1.5. With a level 1.5, we have a privilege escalation. We managed to get the privilege escalation. We managed to get a full access to the database. So what's next? Any guess? What an attacker can do next? Go ahead. Download. Download uh, what? Uh, data. data. We already have all the data. We get a full access to the database, and we're able to exfiltrate all the data in the database. What's next? Uh, delete it. Delete it. Bobby drop tables. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, exactly. The next thing that an attacker will do is to try to get to the OS, to the host itself, right? And then to get to the host, the attacker will probably use so-called reverse shell. The reverse shell is the ability to connect from the host back to the attacker and get the control over the host itself. And I will show you a couple of things here. So in, uh, when we get a super user, a user that controls the database, in my SQL, it's not necessarily means that you control the host, the OS, but in Postgres it does. So in Postgres, in, recent, in uh, more recent versions of Postgres, if you get a super user, you automatically get a shell access. So how do we get shell? There are multiple ways how you can get shell in Postgres. And for this particular scenario, I'm talking about Postgres because, because it's easier to demonstrate. We have this copy from program command. It only works if you have a super user. I have a super user here. I run copy A from program, and then I get a shell access, and I connect to my machine. So in this particular case, this 172.1 is an attacker machine, a different machine, but I will get into the Postgres itself. And I will be controlling the host. Yes, go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, so copy from program will allow you to execute a command on Postgres machine. And when we have the ability to execute a command on a Postgres machine, we can do anything. Here, Postgres is not running from root. So we don't have root. We have a Postgres user. But we control the machine, and it's a big deal, actually. So I have recorded this. And I will try to show you this. So I have, in this case, on this side, I have Postgres SQL Server. 
or on the right side. Is it the right side? It's actually the left side of that. <laughs> uh, I have uh, an attack machine. And on the attack machine, it's running listener for the reverse shell. So the PostgreSQL side will establish the connection to the attack machine, to the listener. And then this is how we will be able to control the machine. So let's, let's uh, see. So I run this copy from program. In this particular example, I use socket. But I, I, there are lots of, if you Google reverse shell, uh, in different languages like Bash or Python or whatever, you will see lots of examples how you can uh, do this. So we are trying to establish the reverse connection. So I now run this command. I have the connection here. And then I can do something like this. Or I can do something like this. So I am connected to my Postgres SQL machine controlling the shell under Postgres user. So the next step, of course, here for the attacker will be to try to find privilege escalation inside of the host to get root. I will not be talking about this because this presentation is about a uh, database. All right, so what's next? MySQL. MySQL shell is more complicated. Uh, MySQL super user does not allow you to, by default, to execute any program or any command. If you, if uh, you as a pen tester wants to simulate that, what you need to do is you need to download, you need to get the uh, libmysql sys, and this is the user-defined library that you need to somehow upload to, to the server. There are ways how you can do this by doing select into out file, but actually this path is closed. It has been closed for a long time. To really simulate that, you need to configure, to you need to disable this MySQL specific variable called secure file priv. You also need to change uh, privileges to plugin dir, which is usually protected on the file system level, and then after that you can play with the libmysql sys, and then we can run a reverse shell. So, what's next? Let's say that we control the host. What an attacker will try to do further? Any ideas? Yes. So I, c I can't hear you. Yes. Look for other machines and try to access other machines. And I will show you example in MySQL. It's a horrible example. It's not possible right now. Don't try it at home. <laughs> so if we control a host, under that user, we can actually, and nothing prevents us as a pen tester, to replace our MySQL server with a rock server. We are under the user that runs a database server. We are the same user. We can kill it. We can kill it and start a completely different process. In this case, we call it MySQL rogue server. Then, what's happened next? A user, a database administrator, an application server, anything, connects to that rogue server. Because an attacker controls that rogue server, it can do various things. MySQL has a very bad security issue that actually surfaced uh, in 2018. And the issue is actually with the MySQL client library. Because what happens is that through the client li library, you connect to the host, and 
you don't know that this is a rogue server because it, it implements MySQL protocol. So what it is? Again, con an attacker controls the server, replace it with a rogue server. And it tricks MySQL client to read any file from that client. So in this example, I can read um, private key in the home directory of that user who connects to MySQL. And this is how I will then be able to do so-called lateral move. So basically, if I read the key from, from that guy, then I will be able to potentially SSH to that. And this is really bad. So how does it work? Basically, it's very simple. Well, it's fixed, but it was very simple. A rogue server replaced any query with load data local in file. And load data local in file basically reads the file from the client and send it over to the server. So it has been identified, 2018, the, the, the was a, there was a guy who identified that and wrote uh, this blog post. You can read that blog post with all the details. This guy has collected the, intercepted the communication between the MySQL client and server and verified that you can basically set a specific flag on the server level to, to trick. And basically, if you can replace any query that comes to MySQL server with load data and file, you can read arbitrary file. If you can read arbitrary file, you can do lots of stuff. You can read the keys, you can read the password file, whatever. And uh, that's basically our attack scenario that implements this. So, conclusion. What we need to do? Of course, we need to protect our application from that SQL injection. It's step zero. And we need to sanitize our input. We need to use prepared statements. On the MySQL side, we need to grant only what we need. Don't grant select star on s select all privileges or whatever. Grant all privileges on star dot star. And then always use latest version of MySQL and PostgreSQL. And also, if we will, so this is very bad scenarios. SQL injection by itself is really bad. But a sequence of bad configuration can make it much more, much worse. And SQL injection means that an attacker can read some data from the application database, which may or may not contain some private information. Usually, databases that contain credit card information or PHI information are isolated. When you grant too much to the user, that will allow a potential attacker to read some other data. But compare that to this. This is really bad. So, not thinking about steps is very dangerous. Security works as onion. There are layers and layers and layers of stuff. The worst things in security happens when there is a number of layers that failed. And not thinking about the database security and only focus on the application level security can actually make it much worse that it could be. So that's all that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, the last thing I want to say is I'm building this new team at AWS. I'm hiring penetration testers. If you are interested or you know someone who uh, may be interested in this, please come see me. And uh, 
uh, will be love to talk about this. All right, so, and uh, I'm open to questions. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you have the ability to read that certificate and the server running from the user, let's say MySQL user, is able to read the certificate, you have that certificate on, on, on the box. You're replacing the process, but you, you still have everything on the box. Yeah. And uh, um, there was a discussion be before about like privileged vs. unprivileged ports. MySQL is running on port 3306 which any user on the system can bind. Uh, and uh, MySQL is running on the unprivileged user, which is the right thing to do. But then if you get an access, if you manage to get an access to the OS level, I mean, you can replace, you can Im impersonate. Mm -hmm, sure. Yes, go ahead. Um, I cannot tell because I don't have that information about, you know, what's percentage, right? I, I, I haven't, I haven't looked at that. Um, there are probably some information o on the internet about how, how much, how many SQL injections has been discovered. I don't know, but, but. Yeah, the WAF is a, is a way to, to, to protect, yes. Uh, but um, at the same time, uh, the what I want to point out is that the code that I showed you is a code that I found on the internet. So people are not very aware still. With all those years passed, people are still unaware of the risk that an SQL injection can can cause. Yes, good. From my experience, I saw that uh, lots of uh, people who are doing penetration tests, like lots of companies that are doing penetration tests, they're so focused on automating things and run their tools that they start thinking that if they run the tool and it shows negative, um, it's all good. In reality, it's not true. Uh, there are certain things uh, that can only be can only be found by you know manual exploration and thinking as a attacker as a black hat right thinking as black hat helps a lot um, tools I love tools but in many of uh, our cases the tools just don't show things because this tools has already been run, right? So if you do a penetration test, for example, uh, this system that you are doing a penetration or a test on uh, probably have been penetration tested before. So you're after something that's more unique. 
So that that's my answer. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Thank thank you very much.